Oh, so. Uh, no. More about gel coat. When the fourth. Don't you call in the. More importantly. So it's another month, Matthew. This is episode 23. Oh, my God. We have found 23 things to talk about, David. And I think we liked four, maybe, tops. <laughs> oh, I've liked way more than four tops in my life. But uh, no, no, no. Four, it, four of our episode subject matters. Oh, God. Yeah. And uh-huh. I'm going to put this in the likes column already, David. Me too. I loved this. I, I have loved this for, what, 23 years uh, because I remember watching this show when it ran first run on CBS in 1998. And I was sad that it didn't get picked up and it didn't continue on. I loved this show. It is a very 90s sitcom. It is very 90s. Mm-hmm. And I, I, it could just be that I love Gene Smart because I, I kept watching it. I watched more than one episode, David. I, I watched a couple. I did. And I kept thinking to myself, we don't deserve Jean Smart. Oh, we don't deserve her. She is fucking brilliant. And I'm glad we can talk about her because I'm not legally allowed to talk about Jean Smart recently because of hacks. <clears throat> her, oh, no. her Emmy winning show on HBO Max, because I'm trying to figure out how I can sue them for creating a fictional sitcom about my imagined life of my fictional drag character. (laughs) There's got to be some type of legal jargon that can legitimize your complaint. There's got to be. Got to be. She's basically playing Carol Lee, for God's sake, (laughs) as I have imagined Carol Lee to be. (laughs) So much so, I've talked to my stylist and my wig designer. I'm like, "Um, here's some pictures of Gene's Gene. (laughs) <laughs> smart in hacks and this is what carol me needs to look like as i transition to an older performer <clears throat> wow so i love gene smart and i'm oft confused for her which is interesting um because back in the 90s i wasn't i was a, i was a lot of caroline ray i got um <laughs> and And Christina Applegate when I was much younger, David. But Carol Lee gets a lot of Gene Smart now. And I'm okay with that. Yeah. Better that than your your Kathy Moriarty's or Kathleen Turner's. Oh, fuck you. You know I got Kathleen Turner all the time. Are you just saying that because you know? Do you? I I, No, I'm just saying as far as... Do you get Kathleen Turner? No. All the time. It's got to be your voice. And people are like, I'm always like, whenever people say it, I always go, well, like more like body heat, Kathleen Turner, right? Or romancing the stone. I'll even take Peggy Sue got married and uh, or War of the Roses. And they're mm-hmm. like, no, more the way she looks today. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, you fucker. Have you seen her lately? Yeah. Dumb and dumber to Kathleen Turner. Sure. That's what. Yeah. Thank she you. Played and the fuck dog you. trainer in Marty and me or whatever, Marley and me, where she played the dog trainer. And it's like, oh, after about 10 minutes, the whole audience realized, holy fuck, that's Kathleen Turner. Because <laughs> they thought it was large. Marge had sent them for Christ's sake. <laughs> well, uh, as we are uh, celebrating and elevating the incredible force of nature that is Gene Smart, uh, we are going to be doing so in the context of this sadly failed half-season sitcom from 1998 called Style and Substance. <sighs> it co-stars uh, a young actress up and coming named Nancy McKeon. I, I believe you've heard of you heard of Nancy McKeon, Matthew? Yes, this show is available on YouTube. We're going to be discussing the pilot, but there were 13 episodes, and I believe all of them are on on the YouTube, aren't they? I did. I watched all 13 of them. Oh, Jesus. I didn't get that far. I I did. Like I said, I watched them the first go round. And uh, but yeah, it was so much fun. And we recommend having a look since we've, you know, still in pandemic mode, theoretically at the tail end, even though numbers are getting worse. If you finished watching Netflix and Hulu 
and Amazon Prime and HBO Max. And I know there are some people out there who have finished all of those platforms. Uh, hop on over to YouTube. They, they have a lot of videos there in, in case you're not aware of it. Um, it's actually it, the site where people can post videos, David. R- what? Yeah. That's mm-hmm. crazy. I know. Hollywood big moguls make television and point cameras at things. We're just ordinary nobodies. We could never yeah. do that. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, let's do, okay, how about we do this um, uh, office lady style? Hey, Matthew, do you want a fast fact? <laughs> and which one am I? I feel like I'm Angela. I would like to be Angela. Um, I, I, yes, because Jenna is a little bit more fastidious and detail oriented. Angela's a little bit more of the, the loose cannon, as it were. J- Jenna's more anal retentive, I might say. Yeah, I might say, but um, just because you want to okay. say the word anal, but yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Let's hear some fast facts, David. Okay, fast fact: when you look at the credits of the producer, creator, writer Peter Tolan, uh, this comes up in addition to a TV movie called Style and Substance from two years prior, nineteen ninety six which starred uh, an actress named Melinda McGraw in the role of Jane Solov. Is that the last name? Sokov? It's, it's no a Greek idea. name, whatever it is. Uh, and in the role of Chelsea Stevens, guess who? Jean Smart. Kathleen Turner. Oh, for Christ's sake. <laughs> it was, uh, uh, it's called a TV movie. What I imagine is it was a, a pilot that didn't get picked up and then they retooled it. And, uh, you know, at that point, Gene Smart was available. So, uh, yeah. So this had apparently been done before in some capacity. So that's good. That gave him time to tweak it and finesse it. Uh, Next fast fact. This show was created by Peter Tolan. And I have a connection, Matthew, to Peter Tolan. (laughs) Peter Tolan was born and raised in Situate, Massachusetts. Mm. I did... Uh, summer theater, youth summer theater in Situate, Massachusetts in my later college years. Uh, Speaking of college, he went to the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, which is where I went to college. Oh my God. Have you trotted on the same state as we have? (laughs) Oh my God. And before he moved out to the West Coast to pursue a big time showbiz, he founded a theater group called Young People's Summer Theater, YPST. That's the group I performed with post Peter Tolan, but one of the creators of that group that he co-founded this this youth summer theater group uh, is named Donald Capen. Donald Capen is a director, friend from yesteryear. We're friends on Facebook. Donald Capen is a producer on this show. Peter brought him out to have him be in the writer's room. Uh, So... Yes, I am sort of by a couple of degrees of separation connected to Peter Tolan. And therefore, close personal friends with Gene Smart. So Peter Tolan started writing for TV with Carol and Company in 1990. Remember that uh, half hour NBC anthology show that kind of brought Carol Burnett back to TV? Uh, And it was quite good, so good that CBS said, well, grab her, get her back. Let's revive the original Carol Burnett show formula in its one hour variety format on CBS. And it was a colossal failure in 1991. That was actually kind of sad. And and it had good people, had Richard Kind, it had Megan Fay on it. I mean, it had a good supporting cast, but it's like, what was Carol Burnett that boy? Was she 60 at that point in her 60s? Still trying to play a you know variety of wacky characters. And anyway, it just it wasn't good. It did not, it it it, it did not live up to the talents of our Carol. Carol Burnett is a fucking goddess and she deserves the best. And that show wasn't good enough for her. Yeah. But Peter Tolan also would write and produce Home Improvement, Murphy Brown, The George Went Show, Larry Sanders. And then after this show, in the future from 1998, he would go on to co-create Rescue Me with Dennis Leary, Mm -hmm. as well as writing, directing, executive producing. That ran from 2004 to 2011. And that's about a New York City firefighter, his work in personal life post 9-11. 
Um, Peter Tolan also co-created the Jim Gaffigan show, and he wrote and executive produced the revival of Mad About You in 2019. Did you watch any of that? I cannot stand Paul Reiser. That's one I will not fight you on. I, I totally get it. I totally see it. I have no reason to. It's just like my grandma used to say. I just see him and I'm like, oh, what a puke. <laughs> so I just I could never stand him. I mean, I like Helen Hunt just fine. But like I mean, it was the wrong. It was no mm-hmm. mad about you was the wrong. I was not the right demographic then or now for the the show. So it just it never hit me. But, you know, I'm sure it's fine. My late great friend, uh, Larry Tackett, who was also uh, basically my gay parent, uh, in his words, he was like, well, Helen Hunt is only the most generous actress I have ever seen in terms of how much she gave and did and carried what was happening on that show to make up for the shortcomings of Paul Reiser. And uh, yeah, I always thought it was a funny stand-up. It was great. And that was, you know, the 80s and the 90s. God. Every fucking, you know, stand up, including what have I just listed? Jim Gaffigan show, Dennis Leary on yeah. Rescue Me. Larry Sanders was the Gary Shandling show. It's like Home Improvement, Tim Allen. It's yeah. <laughs> just, you know, that was it. It was like, honest to God, that was the pathway to television and still is for, for many folks. <sighs> but you might ask yourself, did Peter Tolan ever carry over? Did he ever jump that fence from being a television writer, producer, director, creator into the big time Hollywood large screen endeavors? Yes, he did. He co-wrote one movie, America's Sweethearts, which he co-wrote with Billy Crystal. Oh, God, I remember that. Not a very good film. Oof. I know I saw it. I know I did not enjoy it. And I remember very little of it. That's all I need to say. Uh, So that's my Peter Tolan deep dive there as far as that. But uh, the further connection between him, again, Donald Capen, my friend and all that, is that a college friend of mine, Trish, had an older sister who also went to UMass and was a classmate of Peter's. So I have friends who are friends with him that grew up with him in situate. So... Again, by by association, ergo, Gene Smart is now our close personal friend. Yep, yep. I should probably start texting her. <laughs> but again, not allowed to because of the pending lo- imaginary lawsuit in my head <laughs> about her imaginary <laughs> sitcom, yeah. about my imaginary life, about my imaginary character anyway anyway that's it's it's legal jargon david yes. um but i'm Far glad we found something we can yes. talk about with her because <laughs> i do i do love her uh she is arguably the best actress of her generation and every single series she's done she was what on 24 playing what the president's wife or something like i have never heard anybody mention Jean smart in a sentence without it being and she's amazing on such and such show. Yeah. She's like, she's in a realm of her own. I feel underappreciated, wildly underappreciated. Um, I think Be- she's getting her due now. I think I it's think happening. Eventually finally. it is. But like, I feel like she's in line with like Joan Cusack, who like, no matter how shitty a movie is, people walk out and go, but, but Joan Cusack was real good. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? And yes. I, when I met Joan, I said to her, what's it like to be the best thing in everything you're in? And she like almost burst into tears. Oh, <laughs> like, when did you meet her? Oh my God. That's a hundred years ago. She's up there on my wall and she wrote on the picture. She wrote, Matthew, you're the sweetest. Oh, and then we took a selfie and then, you know, I paid my fifty dollars and. um, (laughs) Did she get you her phone number? Do you do you text with her with Joan Cusack? Um, We well, we message. um, Mm -hmm. So but anyway, um, did you talk about (laughs) you have anything about the director of this of this show, David? Um, A little man named Jay Sandrich, I believe. The late yeah. Jay Sandrich. Yeah. Why don't you talk about Jay Sandrich? Because I imagine you have a lot to say about him and his work. Oh, uh, well, it was, he and I were like two ships passing in the night in my time in Hollywood. Um, it was um, 
I mean, he's one of those, he's directed everyone and everything except me. And I always took it personally. So we never, I never spoke to him when I saw him <laughs> out in public. And I have a feeling that that worked to my disadvantage. But um, people are like, oh, the man with the golden touch. And then you look at his resume and you're like, mm, was it the golden touch? Because, yes, he 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 directed a very few couple high profile things. But he also spent a lot of time on some turds. And <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, Pearl. Um, what's her pussies show after after cheers Rhea Perlman oh ugh. yeah that was his um, but he directed like a episode of um, Golden Girls most famous obviously for um, Mary Tyler Moore show he did and more than one Golden Girls didn't he two oh god I thought he did many of the Golden Girls no okay interesting but just died so i won't have a bad word said against that asshole <laughs> that refused to cast me I, every well it's just i blame him i was up for the role of phyllis lindstrom and he said nobody will believe because i was a foot and a half taller than valerie harper oh. <laughs> they said there's wow. not an apple box tall and big enough to put valerie harper on <laughs> So, Matthew, before we get into the yeah. synopsis, the deep, deep analysis, microscopic yeah. dissection, uh, you want to talk about scheduling a little bit? May I discuss? Scheduling. Mm hmm. Scheduling. scheduling as far as when this show appeared on what night in the schedule of oh. the CBS lineup. From what I understood, it should have been a hit. It, it was... had a prime spot, I felt like, didn't it? Kind of, sort of. Here's the deal. It was only 13 episodes. So it was the typical half season order. And then the big deal is, are you going to get the order for the back nine? Does it do well enough that the network says, okay, complete it, do a full season, not a half season, give us 22. Uh, but this only made the 13, the back nine were never requested. The original five, first five episodes were on Monday night. Yeah. Monday night was Cosby. Not the Bill Cosby, not, not the Cosby show, the, the subsequent Cosby series, which I guess ran several seasons. I don't even remember it. But that was the one with um, where Felicia Rashad was his wife again. Yes. But um, Madeline Kahn was on it. Was she? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. But, so we had Cosby. Uh, Everybody Loves Raymond. George and Leo, which was Bob Newhart and Judd Hirsch, that was a successful series in its time. I just don't remember it because I didn't watch it. And then this, this was on at 930 and it was opposite Frasier on NBC Monday night. And Frasier was in its fifth season. Frasier won all the awards the first season it was on. Why in its fifth season is Frasier on at 930 on Monday night? Why is it not, first of all, leading the hour at eight o'clock or nine o'clock? And secondly, why is it relegated to Monday night? It, it's very weird, NBC, but. Um, See, I guess I was completely off in my timing because I thought it was on sandwiched between the nanny and Murphy Brown. You like, are partially correct. So let me finish my Monday night rant here. Yeah, please. I just want to point out that Frasier was on at 930. I'm going to list the shows that were on previous to it, the shows that preceded it in the lineup. Suddenly Susan, Jenny, as in McCarthy, Caroline in the City. Oh, my God, David. I'm going to walk directly into the ocean. I, and then Frasier in its fifth season. Frasier, it's like, that's where the slot it gets. These three shows are literally the shitty shows from Thursday night that they put in between Friends and Seinfeld that developed an audience only because they were between Friends and Seinfeld and then thought they could ship them off to another night and keep the audience, which they never, ever did. They clearly and, thought Frasier was a woman's show. But, and, yeah, and, and again, it went on to <laughs> Lifetime. And I'm like, why? When Frasier went into reruns in Lifetime announced, oh, my God, we got Frasier. Fuck the Golden Girls. We lost that contract, but we got mm -hmm. Frasier. I'm like, at the core of Frasier is two sons and their relationship with their dad. Yeah. The women characters are really peripheral. 
Uh, okay. So anyway, um, that is the Monday night iteration of the show. Only five episodes. And that was in January and February of 1998. Guess what? The show then went off the schedule and did not come back until July. Now, if you know how TV works, by July, you know what is coming. The next, they're usually in production for the following season by July. Uh, so basically, they already were like, this isn't coming back. But we have these nine other or eight other episodes. So they just decided to burn through them during the summer leading up to the new September season and all that. So then in July... Uh, through September, it was on Wednesdays after the nanny. And uh, yeah. And it was only opposite on ABC. ABC's hour was Dharma and Greg and two guys, a girl in the pizza place. And on NBC, you had Third Rock from the Sun. And then the short-lived Fred Savage series called Working, uh, which also starred the wonderful Dana Gould. And uh, yeah, so... By the time it got to a, a more choice time slot like this, Wednesdays after the nanny, it was already gone and dead. It was already dead and buried. The network had already, even if it had done stellar in the ratings, that ship likely had sailed. And they were like, no, we're not going <laughs> to put in an order for a show that's already technically wrapped and the sets have already been pulled down and thrown into storage. So that's the sad uh, story of this show, I think it could have gone on longer. I think what is out there, those 13 episodes are are just wonderful. And uh, yeah, so the one we're about to watch, the one we're about to discuss is the pilot from January 5th of 1998. And uh, yeah, anything else you want to cover before we get into the microscopic dissection during which we will discuss the actors? Um, nope, I was just looking to see like, if what came next on Jean Smart's career, if like she had moved on to something or something, but it, no, it wasn't the case. No. Yeah. Uh, so, well, let's, so let's continue talking about that. Cause I mean, Jean Smart and Nancy McKeon are the stars. So Jean Smart, of course, most famous for the seven seasons she was on, I'm sorry, for the five seasons she was on Designing Women from 1986 to 1991. Designing Women was on for seven seasons, but Jean was not on the last two. And a lot of people forget that because her departure, and she did get a send off. They had her married and going off and moving away. And it was one of the highest rated episodes, but it was so far overshadowed by all the stupid bullshit that was going on with Delta Burke and her fights with the producers. And Delta Burke's departure happened to be at the same time. So the sixth season of Designing Women brought us Julia Duffy to replace Delta Burke and Jan Hooks to replace Jean Smart. That wasn't her send off. <clears throat> wasn't it? No. She married Bill like three seasons in or something oh was it she had she had her baby and everything she was moving back to poplar bluff or wherever the fuck hog hogwash ball liquor whatever city she was from <laughs> is it I, yeah I, I, she just basically they didn't they didn't really have a big send up the one thing that they did have was that she was on the first like two episodes of season six to kind of welcome her sister carlene was mm -hmm. jan hooks was her sister yeah who showed up and for some reason was well gene smart knew when to walk away uh, clearly and her reasons for walking away were literally she had a baby and she might have even had more kids previous to that i don't know but it was just she wanted she was sick of doing the show after five years and uh said let's and i'm sure she was sick of the delta burke bullshit good god to be on yeah. a popular network tv show and to be having that stuff happening with other people and their egos and all their, their stupidness. And, and I don't even fully understand it because there are so many different accounts. And then Delta Burke and Linda Bloodworth Thomason made nice and they brought her back and they revived the character of Suzanne Sugar Baker in that awful uh, sequel series called Lady of the House. Is that what it was? Women of, women of the House. Women of the House. It is, David, unwatchable. I mean... 
Patricia Heaton can't even save it. And she is <laughs> very Terry different. Gar couldn't save it. That's right. Terry Gar. <laughs> Terry Gar, who in that show, they made her character drunk because <laughs> she was already experiencing symptoms of MS and <sighs> secretly. So they said this way, if you bump into something uh, when you walk around the set, we can blame, we can say that your character's drunk. Oh, <laughs> see, alcoholism is a good thing. It's a really convenient yeah. um, safety net, I mm -hmm. find, mm -hmm. when it comes to comedy. So, mm -hmm. well, good for that. But yeah, it is, it is terrible. I remember I did tune in to watch that because it was a big deal. Uh, and her son and her brother, the character that we never met in Designing Women, her brother, who was autistic, and they make a very big deal about her character calling him the R word mm. because we don't believe in political correctness around here. What was considered liberal at the time is now considered very conservative. You know what I mean? Oh, like, God, yeah. It's amazing oh, totally. how the, the parties have flopped a little bit. Anyway, mm -hmm. but whatever. So yeah. women of the house, don't bother. Do not even bother for a second. So with that, she would go on to many other successful series after this, including 24, including right now, currently. Uh, she just won the Emmy this past weekend for Hacks. Hacks. What is it called? I couldn't think of the name. For Hacks, where she plays. I I haven't watched it and I know I need to. She's like a Are Joan Rivers. Are you shitting me, David? You said I need to and I keep saying I need to. I haven't watched it. Oh my God, <laughs> it hit, it hit me different. I will tell you that um, because of my imagined life and mm -hmm. my imagined drag character, it hit me a lot different than it hit other people. But oh my God, she's so, she's just, she's everything. Oh my God. So <laughs> You want to talk about this fucking episode, David? The pilot made me so happy in so many ways. It was a great pilot. It covered so much ground. Peter Tolan as a writer. I mean, he's no Paul Haggis, but he's really, really good at establishing the characters, giving us some degree of backstory. In the first five minutes. This is what I wrote, David. These are my notes. <laughs> in the first five minutes that is some serious exposition and it's mm -hmm. like um it might as well have said um hey jane this is chelsea oh hi chelsea thank you for calling me chelsea this is jane you know chelsea i've worked for you chelsea for 10 years on your magazine chelsea on your don't and don't forget your chelsea tv show chelsea that i jane am now in charge of after working for you for 10 years and by the way i'm from omaha <laughs> and it's like <laughs> fucking a like the amount of times these characters call each other by their first names like yeah. if i walked into a room that i would expect you to be in david i wouldn't go oh hi david <laughs> i would just say oh hi <laughs> it, it is true you get a lot of that but that's tv writing and they i do love it especially now but yeah expositionally speaking uh first thing nancy mckeon walks in and by the way, Nancy McKeon, uh, this was uh, after Can't Hurry Love. We covered Can't Hurry Love, which was 95 to 96. This is now 1998. And uh, honestly, Nancy McKeon's biggest success post Facts of Life would be The Division, which was the cop show she did from 01 to 04. And that ran for 88 episodes. So, I mean, she still had bigger better things going on but i still would have loved to have seen this uh, to have seen this last a little bit longer but nancy mckeon comes in and she immediately approaches her co-worker trudy trudy weissman played by linda cash the wonderful did, did you recognize linda cash i did immediately and i was like holy shit mm -hmm. i love her what do you recognize her from waiting for guffman she was okay. mrs alan pearl <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. I just want to make sure we were talking about the same thing. That's she's the one who says, "Oh, his dramatical work is <laughs> so." Oh. <laughs> but she is a Second City Toronto alum. She also does appear in Best in Show, so that's her connection to uh, the Eugene Levies uh, and uh, that sort of thing. She's super busy as a voice actress. She has got an IMDb page a mile long. I first heard of Linda Cash 
in a 1994 short-lived variety show on ABC called She TV. Did you see this? I did not. It was a sketch comedy show. It was funny. And it was all women, except I think there was one or two guys in the cast. But the focus was, it was like <laughs> Saturday Night Live inverted. It was all women, but... Uh, less emphasis on the men. And Linda Cash was one of them. She was awesome. Great character actress. Also on the show, Jennifer Coolidge. Who's great. Stifler's mom. Also on the show, Linda Wallum, which you may not recognize that name, but FYI, Linda Wallum and Peter Tolan, creator of this show, used to be a comedy duo uh, in college and toured around and did stuff off Broadway. Cause Peter Tolan's also a, a musician, piano player, writer, um, composer, lyricist as well. Uh, so anyway, a lot of, uh, Oprah full circle moments here. God, he's a regular John Tesh. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I'm going to keep going in this vein. There's also the character of Mr. John, this character who looks like Larry Tate from bewitched. Doesn't he? And in 1998, he was the token gay character. And they had to make sure they emphasized that and that he was proud and talking about his partner, Guy. <laughs> what the fuck name is Guy? And he does say to Nancy McKeon, um, and he's, got, he's actually an Irish actor, but he has that wonderfully erudite, overdone mid-Atlantic thing going on. Uh, he goes, now I know you're from the Midwest, but I'm very proud of my long-term relationship. So if I say anything that makes you uncomfortable, please let me know. So I was saying to Guy this morning as we were lathering each other up in the shower together. And <laughs> that moment is broken by Gene Smart's entrance, but... The, the fact they had to lean hard into this is the gay yeah. character. Which I wish uh, they would have made the little secretary gay because I thought he was precious as all precious could get oh, could be when they were trying to figure out who called her. And there was that back and forth. Was it this? Uh-uh, 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 uh-uh. Yeah. Uh-uh. And just his, I loved him. I needed more of him. He was The adorable. word association was, was great. The ditzy secretary named Terry. Terry, the secretary. Okay, I see what you did there. Uh, but back to Joseph Mayer, the actor that plays Mr. John. He holds a record for Tony nominations. Seriously? He has, not, he has never won, but he has been nominated three times for Best Featured Actor in a Play. No other actor in history has three Featured Actor in a Play Tony nominations. They've had them in maybe other categories or whatever. But 1979 for a play called Spoke Song, in 1980 for a play called Night and Day, and in 1986 for a revival of Joe Orton's Loot. Mm. So just FYI, this man does have a little place in show business history. Uh, and I do say that, as you might have gathered, in the past tense. He died in 1998 in July, while this show was showing the last of its episodes, he died of a brain tumor. Yikes. Had it been picked up, they would have had to recast the role of Mr. John. And it's just so weird. He did have one other credit after this, a, 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 presumably a, a film already in the can. He was in The Out of Towners with Steve Martin and Goldie Hawn. Oh, yeah. The remake of the Neil Simon classic. And it is God yeah. awe. Full. Most people awful, probably remember awful. him as the um, Monsignor in Sister Act, though. And he's also the priest in In and Out. Is he the one performing the wedding with Joan Cusack? And uh... yeah, he's Father Tim in In and Out. So uh, yeah, I'm I'm going through the actors because, like you said, those first five minutes are rapid fire exposition. <laughs> Nancy McKeon says to Linda Cash, "Have you seen Chelsea?" And Linda says, nope. And the thing you need to remember as you're dealing with her more now in your new role position job, she's a freak. And it's like, oh, come on now. She's not that. Well, she did build a successful magazine and TV show empire. But one time she built a gingerbread house and it was built to code. <laughs> so why do you stay working for her, Linda Cash? Well, I'm the best food stylist in the business and she knows that. 
Look at my portfolio here. Well, Mr. John, don't you agree? Isn't Chelsea a freak? And he says, I've been designing interiors for Chelsea Stevens for 10 wonderful years. I find her to be the apotheosis of taste and style. Linda Cash says she's not in the office yet. Oh, she's a freak. One time she built a gingerbread house. It had plumbing. <laughs> yeah. So, and then the gay comments and it's like, okay, so we got the food stylist laid out. We've got the interior designer laid out and the gay character. And uh, yeah, boom, bam, ba-ding. Yeah. And I did feel like they underrated. They didn't use the secretary enough. And if I'd passed away, they could have gone without him. It could have gone on without him. Yeah, maybe. There could have been enough going on between the secretary and, and Trudy and Jane. I, I don't know. I just... Well, I did watch a, another episode. I think it was episode 11, the one that had Carol Channing in it. Yeah. When Chelsea goes on a date and ends up planning a wedding that same week. And there was a couple of nice moments where they were kind of all clumped together, like Nancy McKeon with them supporting her. And this was when I was getting a sense of, okay, kind of we're giving them ways to explore being an ensemble. And this show just, you know, exposition is really the name of the game. Yeah. I wish they could have had somehow more opportunities to be uh, a, a company versus individual, individual. Um, but yeah, it would have been interesting. So when Jean Smart, as Chelsea Stevens, finally does come in the door, she launches into this character establishing monologue that is, I think, magnificently written. I'm not going to repeat it word for word, but the, the gist of the monologue is, I appreciate all of you people who work for me, but you know, at the same time, we could all do better. So be more like me. And throughout it, she is making these side comments about restocking her trout pond, milking her goat, airing out her quilts and making prosciutto jerky. And do you ever read Martha Stewart Living Magazine? No. Martha Stewart Living Magazine has a, a calendar every month where it shows like, you know, plant sugar snap peas and then it also will say cardio and then the next day it will be um restore old furniture actually we haven't stated it yet but the thing the whole entire overarching thing of this show is that Jean smart is supposed to be like a martha stewart she's supposed to be the happy homemaker does everything and uh i just went and grabbed the calendar out of the october martha stewart because my friend steve buys it every year because of all the halloween decorations but um just showing you matthew the calendar it does have laid out which days of the week she does weight training yoga cardio and core uh but here are some examples of what's going on in martha's october october 12th Prepare chicken coops for winter. The 13th, harvest apples and make cider. On the 14th, move tender plants indoors. On the 20th, take drone photos of fall foliage. The 26th, make spicy braised pepper and eggs. See page 57. On the 27th, swap out summer linens for winter bedding. Like all of this homemaker shit. This is her to-do list. And you're like, Bitch, you run a multi cabillion dollar, you're a mogul. How are you able to do all this? He's not. Oh, of course not. <laughs> and some of them will be, you know, appearing on CNN. Some of them do have gigs and promos for stuff. And she'll put a friend, Emeril Lagasse's birthday. Did I pronounce that right? Emeril Lagasse? Yeah. yeah. Did I say that right? Mm -hmm. um, oh, on the 17th, horseback ride. On October 4th, check smoke alarms. And then uh, she also, there's another birthday. Oh, oh, on the 21st, QVC appearance, check local listings. So I just kind of bopped around there. But basically, it a little bit promotes what she's doing and where you might find her and, you know, look at this recipe. But the this exactly mirrors the writing of this monologue. This, you could have taken them and said, uh, make prosciutto jerky, air out quilts. Uh, milk goats, restock trout pond, like that shit would, uh, it would not surprise me in the least to find those on Martha's calendar in her monthly magazine. Well, we've talked, haven't we talked about the podcast or the TV show that her daughter did? 
Martha Stewart's no. daughter. No, it's what, like what, what watching an episode of Martha Stewart living where her daughter is like, she has never milked a goat in her life. <gasps> oh no. And like, really? yeah, Martha Stewart produces <gasps> the show. It's a show for her daughter that aired on the Martha Stewart living channel. Martha Stewart has a sense of humor. She's friends with Snoop Dogg for Christ's sake. <laughs> oh yeah. I, oh, totally. I love their yeah. relationship, but um. But yeah, she's um, they're clearly making her a Martha Stewart character. Um, and there's an episode where Gene Stapleton is on it as her idol, as Chelsea Stevens' idol. And on Regis and Kelly, a drunk Gene Stapleton says, calm down, Martha. Oh, <laughs> oh shit. Nancy McKeon and Charlie and, Ch- and um, Gene Smart are convinced that Martha Stewart is the reason the show was canceled. Oh, really? Yeah. Huh. Yeah. And I don't think it portrays, she's not a monster. If anything, I, I don't know who else could have done this as far as she's clearly, we're playing the age old Felix and Oscar thing. You've got Nancy McKeon, who's trying to keep her nose in the books and keep her to task. This episode, she's trying to get a signature on a budget agreement. And Nancy McKeon does imply this is the first big assignment Mr. Ferber has given me. So there's a light implication that there's someone else above running the big company. Does that come back later in shows? I didn't pick up on it if it did, but um, she does get a lawyer character at oh. some point. Um, but he like he's so pointless. Like they literally you can tell the writers are like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, to do with him, and I don't, I'm not sure even why he was brought in. I think mm-hmm. because um, what's his pussy was diagnosed with the brain tumor, and I think they were like testing out. Okay, we can bring in a, a male lawyer. Uh, something, you know what I mean? So, but. oh, okay. So with looking for the signature to this budget agreement, it's the, I have a task that needs to get done. I'm the one that's organized. And Gene Smart is the loose cannon fly by the seat of her pants and kind of the the crazy chemical spill that needs to be contained. But at no point ever do I perceive Gene Smart to be a monster. They make her quite vulnerable and dimensional. Yeah. So um, let me do what I always do. I have a super crazy detailed list of everything that happens in this episode. And now that we've been talking this long, I'm like, okay, throw that shit out, David. We don't need to do it. So let's go through just the loosest of uh, structures of the plot here is that we have uh, the announcement before Jean Smart steps into her office that her divorce is final that day. Just always fun to have some type of a event start off the series that we can always refer back to. Not necessarily a precipitating event, like, say, Murphy Brown getting out of Betty Ford, but uh, that was a good thing to have. And it does uh, come up that she is divorced. And then um, with Nancy McKeon trying to get this paper signed, Gene Smart is trying to get to know Nancy McKeon and being kind of a pain in the ass. When Nancy goes back to her apartment to continue unpacking, her ex-fiance shows up, played by the wonderful Peter Krause. Yeah. Oh, her apartment, are you a Peter Krause fan? Her apartment with the almost cartoon-like picture of New York City behind her. Oh, like, <laughs> like Jesus Christ. That was the best we could do. Like, okay. But, you mean the background outside yeah, the window? It was like, kind of it a, looked like we're in New York. Yeah. See? <laughs> yeah. And of course, a ridiculous New York apartment. I get it. She's running this Martha Stewart company. So obviously she has money coming in, but a ridiculous New York apartment that mm-hmm. anyway, but yeah. With a lot of juts and angles to it. Yeah. It's like, uh, yeah. Apartments are boxes. Yeah. Let's get Thank right here. Thank you. Uh, but uh, are you a Peter Krause fan? I am so damn. Uh, ugh. Peter Krause could get it. I would hit it so hard. I would break it. I think he is one of the sexiest men in the history of Hollywood. I mean, I'm not 
not i don't i'm not not a fan i'm just i don't i i've never seen him before and have never seen him since and i'm you've a, not seen him before I'm okay with that like I, he okay. didn't walk on the screen i was like oh him <laughs> oh well you should have because he has had an insanely successful tv career oh i'm sure he's lovely from 1990 to 1991, he was on that Carol and Company, that that short lived Cal Burnett thing that Peter Tolan wrote for. That may be how Again, he got this job. Hollywood is incestuous. I do remember totally. feeling like I just like, could we have made him? Oh, first of all, their names are Jane and Steve. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, they white people. OK. <laughs> and then I was like, could we have made him like more interesting like could we maybe made him like just what like maybe show less of a mustache twirler yeah and it was just like and i realized he never shows up again no so i get it but like why wasn't that then on the phone then or something i was like why did we have to meet him on a sitcom like when this like your pilot and all of this like this is when you're meeting the guy next door who is keeping you there or you know or like me, the guy in your, your building that you've never noticed before and mm-hmm. like, or, or the wacky super yeah and your husband yeah. and your boyfriend is maybe on the phone or something i don't know i just didn't see a whole point like in because my my note was why isn't he more interesting and then he doesn't show up for the rest of the series i was like okay that's why we didn't make him that interesting i get it but okay yeah but for all, the only purpose he serves is he is a representation of her past. He broke off the engagement, but now he's having second thoughts and he thinks that she's being ridiculous. You belong back home in Omaha, is it? I'm not sure. Iowa, it's um, Midwest. Omaha, it is Omaha. It's you belong back home in Omaha. You're never going to make it in the big city, Jane. You belong with me and blah, blah, blah. And so um, that's just, you know, the pull of that. And because of having a batshit crazy boss, Nancy McKeon is not sure that she is going to stay in the job. So I think it was just adding to the whole question mark of, is this show going to be a show or is it not? I wonder, you know? Um, So uh, while she's trying to hammer things out though, with Steve, the phone rings. But again, again, my question was, I was like, wait, you're in charge of this empire and you just moved here from Omaha a week ago. How'd you get this job, girl? (laughs) How did you impress Martha Stewart from Omaha? That's like, I'm putting this bitch in charge of everything. So I I was confused. Like, I mean, I I would have liked her character to be a little more like powerful or something. I don't know, but. No, I agree. There should have been something a little more. It is weird because she does say she's only been there a week. She's unpacking her apartment. That's a job you kind of work up to. Thank you. Yeah. (laughs) Anyway, but um... no, you're right. I think you're totally right. It would be nice if at some point it was made clearer, maybe that Mr. Ferber was like the CEO and chairman of the board of Chelsea Stevens corporate conglomerate and corporate that would have been an interesting character to bring in if we had lost uh our mr john would be to bring in the man who is the boss the man who owns chelsea stevens the company but not chelsea stevens the person and having nancy mckeon having to run uh interference between the two of them that would have been a really great uh evolution of the show we're so putting that in the time machine yeah. Matthew. nancy mckeon will appreciate it yeah but they do have the 1998 magnificent time capsule of the phone rings and the answering machine picks up and it's Chelsea. It's, it's Jean smart doing that. Come on, pick up the phone. I know you're there. You couldn't possibly have anything. And just talking the whole time. Are you there? Pick up. How many answering machine messages start with, are you there? Could you pick up? Hey, I really need you. Are you there? Are you around? Huh. Okay. I guess, I guess you're out. Well, maybe um, call me later. I'll, I'll be home. If not, leave me a message or, or, or page me and I, I'll, I'll call you right back. It's like, Oh, 1998 when smartphones were still a decade away. <laughs> and isn't it funny? Like when I call somebody on their cell phone, I don't, I rarely leave a voicemail anymore. Oh God. No. If it's just, cause you're going to see that I called you. <laughs> yes. So you're going to see that it was exactly. me that called and 
unless it's something like I absolutely need for you, then I would have texted you. So it's amazing how voicemails have just become like a, an old person thing. Are you watching Only Murders in the Building? I am. On Hulu. The point when they're like, we need to tell Mabel this. Steve Martin and Martin Short need to tell Selena Gomez something. And it's like, should I text her or call her? And Martin Short says, I think you should text. Calls seem to annoy them. Yeah. And it's like, it's so true. Yeah. And then when you see him text, he is like, greetings, uh, greetings, greetings, Mabel. Mabel, dash. And he leaves the message and then signs it with yeah. his name at the end. And it's so freaking, that show is God damn genius. Yeah. I don't know how you feel about it. Oh, I love it. And I'm in love with um, tie dye guy. Mm-hmm. If you ever wanted to know what my type was, it is that. Oh, tie dye guy. And slight anyway but anyway 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 girl i got but, but, but back to this but yes and uh, you know I, and i will have yeah smartphones the iphone was 2008 we did have cell phones in 1998 that would be another great episode for this to be like you know what jane i want to be able to reach you whenever i want to reach you here you now have a cell phone yeah and that that could have been a uh, they could have run with that there was potential here that's the thing there are shows you watch and you're like what is this and where the fuck are they going with it? Yeah. This seemed to have a direction and possibilities about it. So before we go to commercial, she has to leave Peter Krause, she being Nancy McKeon, to go to Jean Smart's house in Connecticut. Of course she lives in Connecticut, doesn't live in the city. And then we come back from commercial. We are at Chelsea's house, of course, perfectly appointed in beautiful country fashion. I mean, gorgeous. Uh, while Jane is waiting for Chelsea to come downstairs, Chelsea's calling, going, I'll be right down, just be in a minute. In comes this other character named Earl. Yeah. Played by actor Alan Autry. Uh, I didn't realize he already had a series under his belt. All eight seasons of In the Heat of the Night. Yeah. The Carol O'Connor show based on the Sidney Poitier film. And uh, he played football for the Green Bay Packers. Girl, he's, he's had a, a career since the 70s. He's been around. Yeah. If you think he'd he... be better. <laughs> oh, well, here he is doing, uh, it is, it's not even a homage to Elvis. No, he is. He is literally doing an impression, impersonation of if Elvis Presley was the gardener slash handyman slash spiritual advisor to Martha Stewart in 1998. Yeah, it's so weird. And it doesn't get any less weird. Like, oh, it doesn't no. as it goes on? No, like wow. he, he shows up and he's got roadkill in a bag in a later episode. It's so weird. He's weird in the wedding episode. I do remember that. Yeah. Um, but uh, at one point, smartly, this is smart dialogue now, meeting this character that they want to have connected to Jean Smart's home life. So Nancy McKean is like, hey, well, while she's waiting, I, I haven't worked with her long. I'm kind of new to this. Can you help me figure Chelsea out? You know, can you give me any advice to how to deal with her? And he tells a very funny story where he says, in every barn, there's a proud filly, really fiery and hard to handle. And then a great big storm hits and the filly is suddenly very vulnerable and scared and frightened and cowering in the corner. Miss Chelsea is exactly like that storm. Ah, switch there. You see what he did. I like that. I appreciate that comedy. He was also on an episode of Facts of Life. What? Which one? Um, there's an episode in like season eight or nine where Blair um, runs into the lawyer that was the professor, was the professor, is the professor of, but was the lawyer that she got fired because everybody thought she was having an affair or whatever. Oh. He's, in, he's in that episode. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, that that I remember I looked at that briefly because one of the students had previously appeared like had a multi character yeah. appearance in the role of a two different students one actress kind of a thing so finally when Chelsea does appear she says I got busy arranging my linens according to thread count and lost track of time great line 
So she's like, well, stick around, take your coat off. Let me make you something. And Nancy McKean's like, no, you, you need to sign this thing. I just left my ex fiance. And Chelsea's like, the ex fiance is here. You were telling me about him before and blah, blah, blah. And, and at then one point, she proceeds to get laughs out of domestic abuse jokes, David. She's like, why did you break up with him? He hit you, didn't he? <laughs> and then later when she says, I left Steve at home, she goes, the one that hit you? And it's like, he never hit me. What are you talking about? And when she <laughs> sees him in the apartment, she's like, and this is the story, mister, I like to hit. <laughs> and Oh, God, I love her so goddamn much. Because she's just living in her own place, in her own plane. And, and that's perfect for this character. She's so goddamn good. Yeah. So at the end, Nancy McKeon storms out after quitting. She says, okay, if this is going to be the job, I clearly can't do this. And she, uh, oh, oh, I forgot to set this up, is that Earl, before he left, says, hey, want to play a fun game? I fold over the corner of her doily. It really gets her. So on the, the coffee table, there are a series of doilies, and he just folds one corner over. So when Nancy McKeon storms out and just yells at her and says, you are a weirdsmobile. And Chelsea, in response, standing there alone, says, I am not a weirdsmobile. And then she looks down at the doilies and goes, who keeps doing this? <laughs> <laughs> Love. I laughed. I laughed. I laughed out loud several times. <clears throat> and I mean, when she goes back to the apartment and it's like, I hope you don't mind. I cleaned your oven. And just, yeah. <laughs> just every little thing she does is just perfect and right and correct. So next scene, back at the apartment, Nancy McKeon, back with Steve. It's now 5 a.m. She's gone from the city to Connecticut and back and left him there. Uh, so they start to hash it out again with him saying, come back with me. And she is saying, yeah, I, she doesn't say she quit her job, but she does say, I'm not sure the career is going to work out like I thought it did. Then knock, knock, knock on the door. It's Chelsea. Hi, I'm here. Pretend like I'm not here. I'm just going to make some more d'oeuvres. She meets Steve and she does t Matthew, the TV trope of the shutter that separates the kitchen from the rest of the room. Like Mary Tyler Moore had that stained yeah. glass thing where it's like, oh, we need to be able to separate the rooms. Yeah. Have you ever in your life? Yes. You have? Yes. When? <clears throat> my, I demand an explanation. My aunt's, uh, I can't, I guess my dad's aunt's house. So my like great aunt or whatever, um, had we had this family home in Fort Wayne that is no longer there. It was this giant house and I always loved, we went there like twice a year and it was like in my head, like the clue house because like oh. you could go from one, one room, like you walked through a closet and there's a bathroom and then the bathroom had another door that let you out to the front room. Like it was this weird, weird house. And I loved Christmas because it had this um, accordion thing that separated the kitchen from the dining area of the kitchen. And I would sit in the kitchen and just be like, turkey's done. And things like, like <laughs> I would like, I would just, it was like my own little stage. And you were, it, had, it was your curtain. Yeah. It was um, like the Jeffersons, except it had like those little accordion plastic thing. You would just open it up like showtime. Close. Yep, exactly. <laughs> Act three. Close. <laughs> I could. <sighs> Did anyone act surprised when you came out to them? Oh, God, no. I, well, I mean, my first <laughs> words were mother, please. Um, <laughs> so. So with the help of Chelsea uh, yelling out comments from the kitchen and then finally just completely butting in, uh, Nancy McKeon does say goodbye to Steve and sends him home and says, no, I'm not going back with you and we're still through. And that's really nice. And uh, yeah, the final words that Jean Smart says before she goes is she's like, uh, well, here are the hors d'oeuvres I made. Oh yeah, because when she came in, uh, uh, Nancy McKeon says to her, uh, Chelsea, we're in the middle of something really serious. So if you could make some more d'oeuvres, I'll be in the kitchen. I brought the ingredients. And then she comes out with them and she says to her as she leaves, oh, here you go. And I put the rest of the hors d'oeuvres in the fridge. And I hope you don't mind. I cleaned your oven. <laughs> Shut the door. It's so perfect. And then Matthew. Yeah. I thought the show was over. We go to a commercial. And typically at the end of the show, you'll have a little tag scene, a little extra something, something before they roll the credits. 
But I forget, we're not in the same structure as the facts of life where they just have two honk and halves. So there is still a final scene here. <clears throat> it is only three minutes long. It's a short scene, but it is arguably the most important scene in this entire show. It's kind of a gut punch, like, fuck, I was enjoying this and laughing. But at this point, we're back in the office and Nancy McKeon comes in and says, you wanted to see me? And earlier, Chelsea had found some snowballs in her purse, the, um, the, the hostess treat. Yeah. And so she hands her a little present wrapped in paper and unwraps it and it's snowballs. It's like a peace offering. No, oh, you didn't have and- the white ones. She goes, well, it is after Labor Day. <laughs> <laughs> I know yet. Uh, and I then she says, oh, you may not want to throw that wrapping paper away. It's the budget agreement that finally Chelsea has signed for Nancy McKeon. And then they somehow connect, and I forget how we get into this conversation, but she does reveal to Nancy McKeon, she says, you know, I tell the story that I threw my husband out. I did, after he said he was in love with another woman. And then she goes on to a little monologue about discovering how she was neglecting him. And then Nancy McKeon says, Chelsea, are you lonely? And she says, no, (laughs) no. Well, maybe a little. And Nancy McKeon says, it's just hard to imagine. You're always putting together a dinner party for 12. And then Chelsea says, yeah, well, it's hard when you split up and you find out he was the one everybody liked. Yeah. And so you suddenly have this vulnerability and you understand why she's been such a pain in the ass to Nancy McKeon. It's because she needs a friend. So Nancy McKeon says she's going to stay. Chelsea had started a game earlier at her house about, let's play a game called Name Your Favorite Spice. (laughs) And what is her favorite? I didn't even recognize it. I don't remember, but Nancy McKeon said ginger. Yeah, ginger. (laughs) So they share the snowballs and they have this moment of interaction and that's great. And they walk out and Nancy McKeon walks out and shuts the door. And the final line of the episode is, Ginger, she's insane. (laughs) Fade to black. I was not expecting this because the episode up until that point was kind of a open-ended, yeah, she's probably going to stay sort of a thing. There might've been a little bit of a tag, but I did not expect this much, um, shall I say, substance with the style Mm. of the rest of the episode to happen so late. And just, I mean, if I wasn't already in I was totally fucking in here. Yeah. Wonderfully, wonderfully written. My final <sighs> note, David, because I just got so involved in enjoying watching the show. My final thing that I wrote down was, um, I hope CBS paid for Gene Smart to see a chiropractor. Because it must have killed her back carrying this entire show. <laughs> there it is. Come on. There it is. Uh, yeah, 10 I, out of my, 10 for me, David, 10 out uh, of 10. Yeah, I would say this gets this gets a lot of um, what do we call them? Oh, talkaholic chips. That's right. Yeah. We had our rating system. Yeah. What, was it a 10? Was it a 10? System I don't know, but I'm five or four. I'm all in as far as this. How nice to talk about something we highly recommend. And uh, if we haven't spoiled most of the humor, honestly, no, watch it because Gene Smart makes it brand new uh, and watching it the second time for me. That's always the thing. That's where you start seeing the seams. That's where you're like, oh, okay, this is the exposition. You start picking up on where they are working structurally, not comedically. And uh, watching this the second time around, I still was like, this is great. I am thoroughly enjoying this. So I got to watch the rest of them now. I got to go back and remind myself because I clearly don't remember them, but I know I did watch it in its first run. You will especially enjoy the Gene Stapleton episode just because Gene Stapleton is one of the most underrated actresses of our time. I know everybody loves her and everything. She's great. She plays Chelsea's idol. Like she was the Julia Child to to the Martha Stewart generation, you know? Um, And... (laughs) She delivers this character with a full main accent. Oh, you will 
cream in your pants for it. <laughs> okay. And then there is the wedding episode I alluded to earlier yes. where it happens so quickly that of course none of our family can attend. So all of our coworkers are the people and Nancy McKeon's her maid of honor and uh, Mr. John is the one giving her away. And the only famous friend that she can scare up is Carol Channing. Who thinks she's at Connie Stevens' wedding. Yes. And she even says, and, and she's like, I'm, I'm not Connie Stevens, I'm Chelsea Stevens. And then she's like, oh, okay, could I get something to eat? She's like, no, keep working and folding those napkins or whatever. And then later, Carol turns and says, you know, of the Stevens sisters, Connie was the nice one. <laughs> I know, why am I doing Carol Channing when I have you Honestly, here? Honestly, I don't Christ. know, I find it adorable. So... Good episode, uh -huh. David. I liked it a lot. Great yep. episode. And this ends another TV Talkaholic. So Tutti Fruities, thank you so much for supporting the show. I really, really do appreciate it. And uh, we look forward to next month and bringing you something else, hopefully equally as fabulous. Until then, goodbye, smooches, and I love you. Mwah. I got to go see my chiropractor. My back hurts from carrying this show. What? Oh, you were still, oh, I'm sorry. You were still recording. I love you. I love, love you. David. Oh, so. Uh, no, more about gel coat. When the fourth. Don't you call in the. More importantly, 